Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Megan Sloan. I'm the planning director at the Connecticut Metropolitan Council of Governments. Um, we're uh, the Council of Governments for Bridgeport, Easton, Fairfield, Monroe, and Stratford, and Trumbull. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is really the one of the first steps in the update of the region's natural hazard mitigation plan. We're in the very preliminary stages. Um, this is a FEMA required document and um, we kind of have to follow a really prescriptive process with this. So I apologize if some of this is tedious. Chadwick? Good evening, everyone. I'm Chadwick Shirk. I run the Sustainability Office for the City of Bridgeport. I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this is like Megan said, the first step of this process. It's really getting all the hazards that you experience every day in Bridgeport out on paper so we can then get them into a plan to apply for funding to truly address them. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Megan. Okay, great. Um, so just a quick agenda. Um, I'm going to try to go through the PowerPoint quickly. Um, and then we have a mapping exercise for everybody to participate in. And then um, hopefully some of our groups will um, have someone to report out and just go over hazards and uh, potential ways to mitigate them. Um, so again, like I said, this is a FEMA requirement for certain types of um, emergency disaster assistance. Um, and it's, even though it's a FEMA requirement, it's still a very valuable tool for towns to have or cities um, because it's a way to reduce losses associated with disasters. This is some of the, um, you know, federal language around it. Again, it's being proactive about identifying hazards and activities to reduce losses. Um, and then these are some of the mitigation grant programs that require a plan like this. So purpose and need, why, why are we doing this? Um, I think everybody in this room is familiar with what natural hazards are. Um, this is a screenshot of, um, you know, a, an aerial of, um, I think Railroad Avenue by 95. You see all of the impervious surface. Um, so this is, if there was to be a heavy rain event or extreme heat, you know, this would exacerbate that ha those hazards. Um, and then mitigation, there's activities to reduce some of the risks associated with that hazard. Planting trees, you know, that's just one way to, to help, which you know, the city's been really active in doing. Again, most important, this is to reduce loss of life. Um, having a plan like this um, not only does that, but it can reduce damage to infrastructure, residences, um, costs to towns, it's a way to, for education. Um, and then it's a way to also preserve natural resources um, and the systems that, um, those systems that, you know, can mitigate hazards. Um, again, we have a natural hazard and hazard mitigation. These are some of the benefits of um, hazard mitigation. So, Again, like I said, this is very prescriptive. We're going to have to go through a risk assessment where we go through all of the hazards. This is some of the additional requirements that uh, FEMA has now for us um, in these types of plans. We have to include climate change. We have to include regulatory flood mapping projects. We have to include building codes and land use development or ordinances. The good news is we've always done that. Um, what's very interesting about this round is that uh, there's more emphasis on community lifelines and those are public and community organizations that are necessary for communities to function. Um, and here's an example, um, you know, the East End NRZ Marketing Cafe, they're a community lifeline for, for food, um, you know, throughout Bridgeport. Um, and again, they're some of the most important services in a, in a city um, for it to be able to function. Um, quick question, just no one has to answer this now unless you want to, but what are some of the community lifelines that you can think of in Bridgeport? Okay. 
Okay, wait. I'm sure we will. Oh, well, come on, come on, guys. Let's let's throw a few answers out. What are your what are your community lifelines in the South End? Throw one out for me. I can go back to the examples too. Oh. I would say I'd say the Freeman Center is definitely one of the work Mice is doing in the South End with the Resiliency Center. Okay. Um, okay. I have mm -hmm. uh, emergency vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, Greater Bridgeport Transit too. You know, I in um some in Stratford and Fairfield we use the example of the train station. Um. You know, which of course in Bridgeport is there's just so much more in Bridgeport, I think, that you know supports the community. And then what what else has changed? There is a there's a ton of data out there. Um, it becomes overwhelming. Uh, FEMA's developed so many different projects or, or uh, so many different mapping tools. Um, and then locally, we have resilient Connecticut. Um, that's through Yukon, the uh, Climate Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. Um, they've put out a lot of really good pro products about storm surge, sea level rise, extreme heat. Um, and then even though COVID wasn't a natural hazard, I think we would be not doing our jobs if we didn't like have some acknowledgement of the importance of redundancy in planning for natural hazard mitigation plan planning. We really can't like say it's a natural hazard, but we can say that it's important to have redundant systems. The reason I say we can't really say it's a natural hazard is because for something like this, FEMA requires you go through a whole analysis um, and there, there, there's just not the data to look at probability or anything like that. Um, this is what I'll try to go through quickly for. Um, this is um, the risk assessment. This is everything we covered in 2019. In the orange box, you know, all of these can be seen as um, exacerbated by climate change. Again, we're gonna be more intentional about how we um, discuss climate change. It's also important to realize that there's impacts to public health and climate, due to climate change. And then new for 2024, extreme temperatures, um, drought, and of course, all of the, well, luckily there weren't too many federal emergency and disaster declarations. Um, these are, this is an example of some of the impacts that we should um, anticipate with climate change that we're already experiencing, um, and then impacts to public health due to uh, climate change, more extreme temperatures, you know, more vector-based diseases like from mosquitoes, and then, you know, more pests. This is an example of looking at the level of vulnerability to uh, climate change. So, you know, you could be in an area surrounded by pavement or grass. Um, your vulnerability or your exposure to the um, hazard is going to be less if there's, you know, less impervious surface around you. Um, if you did have to evacuate due to a flood, how close are major roadways and or evacuation routes? Um, and then, adaptive capacity if, again, you could be close to a road, but maybe you don't have a vehicle available um, or, you know, you need to call someone to, to pick you up. So this is just an example of, you know, some of the um, factors that go into looking at vulnerability to a natural hazard. In 2020, we had <laughs> Um, 22 weather and climate disasters that cost over a billion dollars. In 2022, and, and this includes East IES. So we, I think we all remember that. Um, 2022, fewer, but it was $165 billion and most likely there was a greater loss of life due to these. So next are hurricane and tropical storms. You know. Luckily, there wasn't uh, an astronomical high tide um, and the storm surge didn't occur during that time or during a high tide. So it wasn't as, coastal flooding wasn't as bad as it could have been, but there was still, you know, wind damage um, and, you know, down power lines. Coastal flooding, this is an example of one of uh, FEMA's um, risk map or mapping products. 
This is looking at risk by census tract to coastal flooding. And then inland flooding. Um, I, I think this is what a lot of people have experienced um, in this room. Um, this is not only a, like a Bridgeport issue, but um, in the other towns that, that we've you know presented in, there, there's been too much, um, too many people impacted by coastal flooding, or I'm sorry, inland flooding, um, especially with some of the extreme rain events we've had. Um, sea level rise, again, um, surface done a lot of really good projections with this. This is an example of the East End um, and Shadow View sent this, so. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's the 20 inches of sea level rise projected out that'll basically occur by 2050. Uh, modeled for a 10 year storm event. So storm events are basically a probability in the historical earth record. Um, so this is a one in 10 year event, 10 year storm event. Um, with the impacts of climate change, these are occurring on a much more regular basis than the 10 year cycle. 50 year storms are now 10 year storms. So it's very important for these conversations to look at sea level rise in comparison with the storm surge that's gonna come to accurately plan resiliency and mitigation efforts. That was great. <laughs> Um, severe storms, I think we know what to do, um, especially in winter storms, um, but they still can be, you know, really impactful to an area, especially with long-term power outage. No matter how much you prepare, sometimes there's, you know, it's still going to be cold. Um, dam failure, um, this is a requirement. Um, this is an example of a dam in, um, by the zoo. And um, I think what's, so the, the state is very proactive about dam inspection. Um, so it, that's less likely to be a hazard um, just because of the, the amount of attention that the, stands, the state's dam safety office. Uh, but as, again, we still have to look at that. And then extreme heat and cold. Um, so this summer, it was kind of weird because it really wasn't that hot most of the time. Um, but January, 2023 was Connecticut's warmest J January on record. And, um, you know, but in early February, 2023, we had an extreme period of cold. So I think we're gonna experience more extreme temperatures and most likely overall, it's gonna be you know, extreme heat, but again, it's, there's just, we, we are, it's a new pattern of temperature. Um, drought, I was surprised when I did this research that we had a drought in 2022. And then wildfires and earthquakes, again, you know, they're less likely, but they're a hazard that we have to um, take into account. So these are six categories of mitigation activities what we're going to be, you know, they can all be used towards flood protection, but they could also be used to mitigate other hazards too. Um, I have, I put this on everybody's table. Um, these are all examples of mitigation strategies. And um, the next thing, you know, we like as, as you look at the maps and mark them up, um, that um, you know, you keep in mind ways to mitigate hazards and vulnerabilities. So we have four maps. Um, I I should have printed more, but it uh, turned out at these events has hasn't been what we anticipated, and we didn't want the maps to outnumber the people. Um, but um, if you'd like, you can start marking up the maps. You know, indicate areas that are vulnerable to natural hazards. Um, and then, you know, these would be examples of hazards that you'd want to indicate. Um, and then indicate if there's important community assets. One of the maps does have like schools and um, other critical facilities for evacuation. Um, and then, you know, think about ways to mitigate hazards. I'm hoping after 10 minutes, you know, we can provide, a, each person or you know each group or however way you want to organize um you know can provide an overview of um 
of some of the hazards in your neighborhood or you know that are important to you? Chadwick, let's see. I think the only thing is um, I'll go around and kind of just read out what the maps are. <clears throat> if you want to organize yourselves either around a specific map around the neighborhood or community you're a part of, it might help create um, more productive discussions, just kind of focusing on an area. So this one is flood hazard areas for the whole city. It's a comprehensive map. The one over at this table is specifically for the south end and their hazard zones. This is for the south. Okay, so she is on the south end. Okay. She has flooding issues. I tried that before this one. Oh, right. We have the north. Right here. And the north side's on that table. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Is there a west side? So we have, we have, uh, is anyone else doing north side? Oh, okay. 